little farther, or for had we gone a little farther, we had not been there to be to bring you the news to you. But what have you? What have you? What have you met with, men? While we are almost in the valley of the shadow of death, unfortunately, we happened to look around and saw the danger before we came to it, Christian. But what have you seen? Men seen by the valley itself, which is dark as pitch. We also saw the hobgoblin, satire, and draglin, dragons of the pit. And we heard in the valley a continual howling and yelling like people in unspeakable misery, bound in addiction and affliction and irons, and over the valley hanging a discouraging cloud of confusion. Death always spreads his wings over. In a word, it is dreadful in every way. Okay, you can stop right there for now. So what is he talking about? <clears throat> Talk about hell. You got that right. Okay. Kind of sounds a little bit like it anyways, don't it? <laughs> yep. So there were two men who were almost in the valley of the shadow of death, but they had enough foresight or whatever to look ahead and see the danger, and they turned around and came back before it was too late. So Christian had asked them what had they seen that put such fear into them, and they said that they had saw the valley itself, which was dark as pitch, and that there were basically, you might say, demons and dragons of the pit uh, in the, on both sides of the, of the pathway, right? Yep. And they heard in that valley a continual howling and yelling like people in unspeakable misery, bound in affliction and irons, and over that valley hangs a discouraging cloud of confusion. And death always spreads its wings over it. In a word, it's dreadful in every way. Uh, for those who have gone down into the valley of humiliation, where we have to deal with our own pride, uh, or I should say where God deals with our pride. He allows us to go into the valley of humiliation because we do have a pride that has to be dealt with. And uh, so that pride has to be humbled before him. And uh, so uh, lots of times, hopefully, we only have to go into that one time and not over and over again before we learn the lesson. But many a proudful man has had to, make the journey down into the Valley of Humiliation more than once. Uh, and so uh, after we come out of that, you would think that we'd get a little bit of a rest or something and that maybe there'd be a, a period of peace or recovery or something. But it seems like almost immediately Christian here is led into the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And in this valley, it seems even worse than the one before, right? Uh, there's okay. things on... Uh, sounds and sights uh, here in this valley that are very scary, right? And uh, if you've uh, had, to, the, had to traverse through the valley of the shadow of death, whether that be through some sickness that you had that almost cost you your life, or whether or not you've gone through that valley because someone very, very close to you died, uh, you, you've been in this valley. And so you know a lot about what he's talking about and, uh, and how that uh, these things continue to progress into our lives as we try to, to try to traverse the valley of the shadow of death. So go ahead and pick up again there. Any, any questions, comments before we move on? No. Quite clear. Not a good place. Yeah. So picking it up with Christian from what, you have said, who wants to read there? I'll read some more. Go ahead. From what you have said, I believe this is my way to the desired heaven. Men, it may be your way. We will certainly not choose it for you, for ours. So they parted, and Christian went on his way. But with his sword drawn in case he should be assaulted, I saw in my dream there was a deep pitch to the right, running the entire length of the valley, 
and in this ditch, which the blind had left the blind in every age, they're both, they, and there both have perished miserably. On the left was a dangerous marsh, and there a good man falls into this. He can find no bottom for which to stand, on which to stand. It was unto that bog that David, that King David once fell and would have been smothered had he not been able to pull himself out. The pathway there was also extremely narrow and had, and Christian had to be more careful than ever. For he had tried to avoid the ditch on one side, he almost, and he almost slipped into the mire on the other. And when he uh, tried to escape the mire, he had to be careful not to fall into the ditch. I heard him sigh bitterly for both. For besides the dangers mentioned above, the pathway was so dark that often when lifted up, when he lifted up his foot to go forward, he did not know wh where or upon which he should set it down next. Okay, you can stop right there. So what, what is he talking about? Staying on the narrow path again. Okay, what is the uh, dangers on both sides here? Well, the... What? I want to get to uh, problems. Problems, okay. Well, the pit is death, and the the marshes you're going to drown or be smothered by it. And either way, you're not going to come out of it. Jesus said back in Matthew that if the blind lead the blind, both of them will end up in the ditch. Yeah. Right. So the danger on the right hand side is not allowing the light to light to lead you. It's a very narrow pathway. <clears throat> and it goes on to tell us here that there's not a whole lot of light, right? The pathway is dark. It's hard to, hard to tell where your footing is supposed to be, right? It's like being out in the woods at night without a flashlight, right? Yeah. yeah. Might get a stick in your eye, right? <laughs> <laughs> Or like when I when I was working, um, trying to find out where my foot was with stupid bifocals on. You can't see where quite where you put your foot in the right spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so on the left hand side, it, it seems like there's a a deep dark pit that's like quicksand. There's no bottom to it, right? So when yep. you fall into it, you you can't gain any footing. You just you just keep sinking deeper and deeper. And then it talks about that King David had once fell into that and uh, he had almost smothered, uh, but he was able to, uh, to pull himself out. How was he able to pull himself out? Probably for um, repentance and, and prayer. There you go. He had fallen into that pit by doing what? Swimming. He had fell off the narrow way that leads unto life, and he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, right? And a son oh, that right. born out of the relationship, right? And then he yep. had her husband killed. And Psalms 51 tells us about this deep, dark pit that David found himself in, right? Yep. And until he repented and confessed his sins, he just kept sinking deeper and deeper. He said, as, I, as long as I continue to hide my sins and not confess them, then he said to the point, even my bones were being broken, right? And so uh, he was talking about that his physical health continued to suffer as long as he harbored unforgiveness or harbored bitterness and and tried to hide his sin from God instead of confessing it, right? Yep. And on the right-hand side, you know, there seems to be this, uh, this place where all of this howling is coming from, and this is the fear of death. This is the valley of the shadow of death, right? Yep. And so the right-hand side is all of those who would have died without Christ, 
howling out, right? And their howls and their screams and all of the, the demons and everything that are in that place make us afraid of death, right? And so the same thing happens whether we almost reach the point of death in the sickness or whether or not we have to go through that grieving process of losing someone very, very close to us. It's almost the same thing. And so uh, you go into that valley not really knowing what's there. Christian didn't have any idea what was in this valley, right? And the pathway that led through it was hard to find, right? And there was dangers on both sides of the narrow pathway. And so if he misstepped to the left, he found himself off into this endless pit. And if he misstepped to the right, he found himself in all of this misery. And so it was, it was really hard to find your footing and to find a way through. And certainly the grieving process is like that. And certainly also is wallowing in your sins like that, right? That's for sure. Because it's the wages scary. of sin is death, right? And there the death we fear is the second death, right? Along with the first. Because right. we'll, we'll eventually, hopefully, conquer our fear of the first death because that's already been conquered, right? Right. But it's our fear of the second death, of being cast from the presence of the Lord forever, right? That's a, that's a real fear, right? All right. Uh, poor man, where art thou now? Thy day is night. Good man, be not cast down. Thou yet art right. Thy way to heaven lies by the gates of hell. Cheer up, hold out. With thee it shall go well. So we're reminded here that the pathway that leads to life goes right by the pits of hell, right by the open mouth of the gate of hell. And we have to be careful to stay on the pathway lest we fall into the pit, right? Yep. Midway through this valley, I noticed that the mouth of hell, close to the pathway, now thought Christian, what shall I do? Flame and smoke spewed out continually, and in such abundance with sparks and hideous noises, things that could not be dealt with by Christian sword, as was Apollyon. So we learned something here, that back in the Valley of Humiliation, the armor of God and the sword of the Spirit are our needed weapons. But as we're traversing through this Valley of the Shadow of Death, our, our weapons are of no use. And we have to use different weapons. We have to use a different strategy, right? We were confronting Apollyon in the valley of humiliation and then confronting our own pride. And so uh, our, the, the armor of God and the sword of the spirit was very useful in that battle. But it tells us here that it's basically useless to us. He was forced to, he was forced to sheath his sword and take up another weapon. And another weapon is called all prayer, right? So okay. in the valley of the shadow of death, our weapon is prayer, right? Right. And our prayer is based upon the word of God. So it's still the word of God, right? So yeah. we pray the word of God and we ask God to be faithful to his word and deliver us out of the pit, right? Mm -hmm. Keep our feet upon the narrow pathway. Don't let me in my grief and in my overwhelming uh, sorrow, sin against you, right? Right. Comments, questions before we move on? Dixie's getting a phone call. <laughs> no, I, I was after another aunt. Hello. How about an uncle? <laughs> okay. These stupid things keep coming in by the hundreds and I can't kill them. 
I've, I've <laughs> used the ortho uh, house defense and they just keep coming in. Like they don't even, doesn't even phase them. What? <laughs> yeah. They've mutated. Yeah. <laughs> no. So anyways, he was crawling around on the floor and I was trying to stomp him. <laughs> <laughs> Questions or comments? Orco. Does that make you pick Pather? Yeah. <laughs> dead end, dead end. Anybody? Okay, let's keep going. So he cried, Oh Lord, I beg you, deliver my soul. And thus he went on a great while, yet still the flames reached towards him. Also he heard sorrowful voices and the sounds of great movement back and forth, so that sometimes he thought that he should be torn in pieces or trodden down like mud in the streets. He saw and heard these frightful sights and dreadful noises for several miles and reaching a place where he thought he heard a company of friends coming forward to meet him. Fiends. Fiends coming forward to meet him. He stopped and began to consider what would be the best thing to do. So we have to cry out in our prayers and in the crying out of our prayers, we have to continue to trust in the Lord to be able to deliver us. There's a psalm that uh, basically, uh, if you clicked on, I think, your 229 number there off to the side, that that'll lead you to Psalm 69, uh, where uh, David prays a prayer about delivering himself from the deep pit and the mud, right? And so uh, it, it leads back to scripture here. Psalm 69. Psalm 69, yep. I think beginning in verse 14 through like 19 or something like that, if I remember correctly. You want me to see if I can find it real quick? Somebody have it? No. All right, let me see if I can find it real quick. Let me go and find my screen share here. Let's see, I think it's right here. Got different numbers. Yeah. Got different. Yeah. Where's the 29? Okay, it's not bringing up the scripture one. I don't know why. It disappeared somewhere. <laughs> Does anybody else have it? Let me get my bibble out here. What was the script again? Psalm 69, beginning in verse 14, David says, Deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me, and out of the deep waters. Let not the flood water overflow me, nor let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut its mouth upon me. Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies. And do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Right? So when we're in this uh, valley of humiliation, I mean this valley of the shadow of death, prayer, and especially prayer around the word of God is our weapon of choice and the weapon that we need, right? So we should be constantly developing our prayer life, right? What happens if we don't have any prayer life and we get into the middle of this valley where the footing gets so rough and things are so dark that you don't, you're, you're almost afraid to do anything, make any kind of progress at all. 
because you're afraid you're either going to stumble to the left or to the right. And Absolutely. so the only thing that then shines a light on the pathway so you can see your way out is prayer. Yep. If not, you go home. Yeah. <laughs> you, may, you may end up in one of those pits you can't get out of, right? That's right. Yeah. And the depression will just go so very deep that you're right. You know, the depression might overwhelm you, you know. There is a way through the valley of the shadow of death, and Jesus promises to lead us through, right? He promises that his rod and his staff will comfort us in the middle of it. And so oftentimes we're in that valley of the shadow of death because there's some corrections that need to be made in our course, right? Or in our attitudes or character, whatever have you. And oftentimes as well, besides that, we're overwhelmed with grief and sorrow and we just need to be comforted. And so his comfort and his correction lead us through this valley of the shadow of death, right? Because sometimes our the theology needs correcting because we don't rightly understand that death's been conquered. And so our grief is much, much deep, deeper than it should be because we feel like this is the end and we're never going to see them again. And we all reach that pit. Don't just hear me. I, I, I know, right? And <laughs> so uh, it is only the truth of the word and your prayers around that truth that show you the way out of that pit and, and shows you the pathway that leads through the valley of the shadow of death so you don't end up stranded in the middle and you don't end up falling in the ditch to the left or to the right. 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 Questions, comments, criticisms. <laughs> okay, he saw and heard these frightful sights and dreadful noises for several miles, and reaching a place where he thought he heard a company of fiends coming forward to meet him, he stopped and began to consider what would be the best thing to do. Sometimes he had half a mind to go back, and then again he thought he might be halfway through the valley, and he remembered how he had already conquered many dangers, and that the danger of going back might be much worse than that of going forward. And so he resolved to go on. And we will all reach that point as we're in this valley of the shadow of death. We'll feel like it's never going to end, and then we'll wonder, well, if I turned around and went back, that might be worse than going forward. And so we decide that we're just going to keep putting one foot in front of the other and making forward progress, though sometimes it seems like we go one foot forward and two steps back, right? Right. Questions, comments again? We don't be able, we're not able to see the the word on the, on your screen. No? No, not right now. We see the, you and who's the Kindle who's book, you're not seeing it? No. No. Oh. We yeah. see you and, and the participants. Okay. It says I'm sharing my screen. Well, how come it's not? I don't know. What about now? There I, you go. You're talking. Okay. So I don't, it disappeared for some reason. I don't know why. It's because they want to hear it just like I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we covered that. So it jumped screens on me as I did that. All prayer and one in the street. Okay, sometimes he had half mind to go back. Then he thought he might be halfway through the valley and he remembered how he had already conquered many dangers and that the danger of going back might be much worse than going forward. And so he resolved to go on. Yeah. Somebody want to pick up uh, where it says, yet the fiends? Yet the fiends seemed to be coming straight at him and he cried out forcefully, I will walk in the strength of the Lord God. So the fiends gave way and came no farther. One thing I could not help but noticing 
by now, poor Christian was so confused that he did not know his own voice. I realized this because just as he came up to the mouth of the burning pit, one of the wicked ones got behind him and stepped up softly and whispering, suggesting, suggested terrible blasphemes to him, which he actually thought had come from his own mind. This was a great trial to Christian than anything he had met before, had met with so far, even to think that he should now blaspheme him that he loved so much before, yet if he could not, if he could help it, he would not be, he would not have done it, but he had not the understanding to either cover his ears or to know where these blasphemes came from. Okay, we can stop right there. What's going on in, in Christian's mind at this point? Satan's talking in his ear. <laughs> but he's also so confused that he can no longer hear the voice of God. And he's hearing a voice, but he's not sure if it's his own or where it's coming from. Right. Uh, and it tells us as we go through the grief share that grief is a tangled web of emotions. And that tangled web of emotions leaves you in such a confused state. You don't know whether you're coming or going sometimes. And you don't know what voices you're actually listening to. And even if it was your voice, you wouldn't even recognize your own voice anymore. Right. right? That's how That's deep. Deep a pit that grief takes you down into. Did you say something, Chris? I just said that's very, very true. It is, isn't it? Yes, it is. When Christian, somebody want to take off from there? When Christian had traveled in, in this desolate condition for some considerable time, he thought he heard the voice of, of a man going before him saying, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Then he was glad, and for these reasons, first, then he was glad for these reasons. First, because he gathered from this that he was not alone in this valley. There were others here who feared him. There were others here who feared God as well. Second, since he perceived that God was with them in this dark and dismal state, then why not with him, even though in the present circumstances it did not seem so? Stop right Third, there for a second, because what's he talking about here? Uh, let's see. God's walking with him. Well, he hears a voice, but he's not really sure where it comes from, Yeah. right? And the voice is, seems to be quoting scripture, but he's not sure if it's God or if it's, he thinks it's somebody else who's in this valley with him and they're quoting the word of God to encourage their own souls, right? Right. And so his, his thought is, well, God is certainly with some other individual because they're quoting scripture. How come he's not with me? Why am I all alone? Do you see that? Yeah. See how the mind will begin to play tricks on you in the valley of the shadow of death? It'll start making you think that God has abandoned you there, right? Oh, yeah. And oh, I'm yeah. never getting out, right? I'll be here forever, right? Right. And it sounds like Satan's still trying to manipulate us. Sure. He's he's planting thoughts in our minds that we're not even sure where they're coming from anymore, right? All right. Okay. Go ahead. Start with the third, dear. Third, because he hoped he could overtake them and have company by and by. So he went on and called to the man who was ahead of him. But the man did not know what to answer. For he also thought he was alone. And before long, he, it was daybreak. And Christian said, Heat, 
He has turned the shadow of death into the morning. Now he looks back, not out of any desire to return, but to see by the light of the of day what hazards he had gone through in the, in the dark. So he saw more perfectly the ditch that, that was on the right and the marsh that was on the left and, and, and how narrow the path was between them. Also, he now saw the, the hobgoblins and, wow, <laughs> satyrs and dragons of the pit afar off, for after daybreak they did not come near him, yet they were revealed to him according to that which is written. He discovered us, see things out of darkness, and bringeth out to the light the shadow of death. So what's he talking about? <clears throat> Well, it looks like there was all these hobgoblins and all these and everything. But eventually, eventually he was brought out of, out of the darkness. So that's what we've been saying to people for a long time, especially through grief share and other things, that mm -hmm. the light eventually comes back on, right? You're in a deep, deep darkness, darkness and you don't really know what's going on. You don't understand much. But then all of a sudden, weeping that endured for a moment gives way to the light of the morning and joy comes in the morning. When the lights come back on, you can look back at the path of which God led you through, even though you questioned whether or not he was even there, right? He turns the light back on and you go, oh, wow. Look at what you brought me through, Lord. Look at all of the dangers that you kept me from and you brought me safely through and now the lights are back on and I can see clearly, right? Yeah, just, just kind of showing you that he's still in control, but we didn't think so for a minute. Yeah, the mind is filled with doubts and fears, right? But then God in his merciful, loving kindness and grace turns the lights back on and goes, now take a look behind you and what all that I brought you through. It's kind of like the old footprints poem, right? Right. In those deepest, darkest points of my life, why is there only one set of footprints, Lord? Why did you abandon me during those times? And then the answer was, the Lord said, it was in those times that I carried you. Right. Right. I knew the way, so I picked you up and carried you, right? Good stuff. Good stuff. Start again with Christian, somebody. Christian was greatly affected. I can read it. Christian was greatly affected by his deliverance from all of the dangers of his solitary way, which though he had feared them more before, he now saw more clearly because the light of day made them conspicuous to him. And about this time, the sun was rising, and this was another mercy to Christian. For you must note that though the first part of the valley of the shadow of death was dangerous, the second part, which he had yet to travel, was far more dangerous. From the place where he now stood to the end of the valley was the way, the way was filled with snares, and traps and gins and nets and pits, deep holes and slopes. Had it now been dark as it was when he came through the first part of the way, and had he had a thousand souls, they would have had reason to be cast away. But as I said, the sun was rising, and so he said, his candle shineth on my head, and by his light I go through the darkness. In this light, therefore, he came to the end of the valley, and I saw in my dream that the end of this valley lay blood and bones and ashes and mangled bodies of pilgrims who had gone this way before. And while I was wondering about the reason for this, I saw a little ways in front of me a cave where two giants, Pope and Pagan, had lived, but whose power and tyranny the men whose remains lay there were cruelly put to death. But Christian passed this place without much danger, which I wondered about. 
I have learned since that Pagan has been dead for some time, and the other, though still alive, has grown so crazy and stiff in his joints because of his age and of the many dangerous skirmishes he has met with in his younger days that he can now do little more than sit in the mouth of his cave, grinning at the pilgrims as they go by and biting his nails because he cannot attack them. What is he talking about? What did he learn in the Valley of the Shadow of Death? It's just, you got to keep keeping on and, and, and uh, know where your power comes from and just keep following it. Very true. And you need more light for the second half of the journey, right? So God turns the lights on, but the journey's not over yet. All right. right? You just need more light now because the second part is even more dangerous, right? right? So in that light, he sees something. He sees two giants. One of them is dead and has been dead a long time, but there are bodies scattered all over the place where people have come that far and lost before, right? And lost their way right there, right? And then the other one is Pope. So what do these two giants represent? And what did he actually come to understand in the valley of the shadow of death? Hmm. What's the name of the first giant? Pope. No. Nope. Pagan. That's the second one. Oh, I just look at Pope and, and pagan. 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 What is pagan? Pagan is your old carnal nature. Yes, it is. The giant of your old self is dead. Your old man is dead. You battle with the old man and with the flesh in the valley of the shadow of death. And the old man is left there. Right? But many people didn't, didn't find the victory in the battle and their bones and their bodies lay scattered. Right? Many people never won the victory over self right over the old nature what does pope represent formal religion remember john bunyan is part of the breakaway from the catholic church in that day the reformation period right so okay. the pope here is the formal religion that has no life in it right Right. It don't but now the formal religion is so old to him that it no longer has any effect upon him. The, the Pope can't even leave his cage, you know, can't even leave his cave and come out and pursue him because he's old and arthritic, right? And so in other words, he's learned enough in the light now where the draw of formal religion has no more draw to him, right? So his old self and his religious self have both been dealt with in the valley of the shadow of death right amazing we all got to go through this folks this isn't something you get to avoid <laughs> right right yeah but there's hope right and there is light at the end of the tunnel so to speak right that when we come out we will be better than we were when we went in right because we'll leave behind a lot of things that can't go any further on the journey from that point forward, right? Those two things must be left in the valley of the shadow of death because neither one of them can go to the celestial city, right? Right. Your religious self and your old nature, both, neither one of those can go on to the celestial city. Questions, comments? Okay, we'll read this uh, next little paragraph here. So Christian went on his way. Yet at the sight of the old man who sat in the mouth of the cave, he did not know what to think, especially since the man spoke to him, saying, you will never change till more of you be burned. But Christian kept quiet, and looked cheerful, and thus went by without being harmed. And then he sang, O world of wonders, I can say no less. 
that I should be preserved in that distress that I have met with here, O blessed be, that hand that from it hath delivered me. Dangers in the darkness, devils, hells, and sin did compass me while I this veil was in. Yea, snares and pits and traps and nets did lie. My path about that world, worthless silly, I might have been catched, entangled, and cast down. But since I live, let Jesus wear the crown. What is he talking about? Does that sound an awful lot like what Paul says, that I have been crucified with Christ, and yet nevertheless I live, and yet it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives within me. Let him be crowned as king of my life. Right? Right. Good stuff. The old man, the old religious man that's still there alive says, look, you think that you've, uh, you've, come, you've actually conquered something? He says, there's still more that's going to have to be burned. It's a little warning shot across the bow. You, you're not through yet right? God's dealt with the surface things, but he's going to go much deeper, right? The old man and the religious man are surface things. There's things much deeper than that that still have to be dealt with, right? Very true. And we are out of time, so we're going to call it right there. So we'll pick up with now as Christian, and I'm going to See if I can highlight this so that I can, uh, yes, so that I know where we are next week. There. All right. Questions, comments? I'm going to stop my screen share so we can see one another again. <laughs> well, I can't All see All except you. for Chris, we can just see the emblem of her phone. <laughs> we'll have to imagine her, her neatly kept gray hair. Right, and that Let shiny, me, and that shiny no, no, smile. No, no, you don't. You don't want to imagine anything about the hair. No. <laughs> yeah, cause, cause right, right now, right now, it is a, <laughs> a, a total, total, total mess. Mess. <laughs> we've got, we've got some uh, ladies in some of the other Zoom groups that leave their camera off because they don't want anybody to see them. So. I, I don't want nobody to see me the way I look right now. No way. Uh, my, my hair's my probably hair's... a mess too, you know. I, I've been out and it's been wind torn and I've been out shopping. So, but, I, you know, like men, we, we could care less, right? We're not trying to impress <laughs> anybody. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's, this is when I, gra if I have to go out, this is when I grab my hat. Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> a hat and a mask. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yep, my mask and my hat. 